God is good all the time. All the time. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's a, it's a good day to be among God's people. Every day is a good day for that. Amen. Every day is a good day for that. But I think this one may be even a bit more so because of those that are going to be entering the waters of baptism. What a privilege it is to walk with you in that. Um, I don't get used to doing this. I don't take it for granted. I get excited. Uh, every time we do this, I didn't think we were going to be baptizing six. Last week I thought we were going to be baptizing maybe one, so we're baptizing six. So praise the Lord for that. And uh, it just seems like whatever he was doing last year with the 23 is just continuing. So, so praise the Lord for, for his work. Jesus must increase, but we must decrease. Um, I'm assuming most of you are going to be watching uh, the big game tonight. I, I usually check out a football when the Browns are knocked out, so the postseason's not really been much of a concern for mine in my life a couple of times. Next year's going to be different. Uh, it is going to be different. But but this year, I think, is is worth a watch just so we can uh, we can cheer on Colt McKibbitts. we got a hometown boy in the Super Bowl, which is which is pretty amazing. That I don't think has ever happened before in my lifetime. But uh, if you didn't know, he was, a, he was a Union local grad about uh, nine years back, I think, and now he's starting for San Francisco. But um, but I thought it was pretty fitting. I was I was in the Word this week, and we've been trekking along in the Gospel of Mark, and I thought it was pretty fitting that of all weeks, uh, this is the one where I would land on Jesus returning to his hometown after he's become very, very famous. He's had crowds following him, and so this is Jesus returning to his hometown. And, and i got to assume, looking at this, and I think you're going to agree, that, that win or lose tonight for Colton, he's going to have a better reception than what Jesus has in this text. Would you turn there with me, if you would, to uh, Mark chapter 6. Open your Bibles, open your hearts with me as, as we continue there. We're, we're starting at verse 1, and uh, as you find your place, I want to ask that you stand with me, if you would, in reverence to what God has spoken. This is the Word of God. These are the words of God given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We've got to receive them as such. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, and what is this wisdom? given to him, and such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his own relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. And he was going around the villages teaching. Say it with me if you believe it. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your unchanging word, and we pray as we look to it again that, um, that we would be changed by it, that as your son prayed in uh, John 17, you would sanctify us in the truth. Your word, he said, is truth. Minister to us this morning. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would show us more of Jesus, that you would make us more like Jesus. You alone are the God who's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, Ephesians says. So, so God, asking expectingly this morning, asking believingly this morning, we won't leave here like we came in Jesus' increasing name. Church, would you add your amen to mine this morning? Amen. amen. You can be seated. This morning, I, I want to let the Word of God speak to us about doubt versus unbelief. And I want to draw a distinction between the two because I think the Bible clearly does. And then I want to make a couple applications from this text. So everybody... Do this with me. Warm up your fingers. We haven't done this in a little while. I, normally I got everything on the screen. I don't have everything on the screen this morning. I want you to warm up your fingers. If you
you are reading a Bible from a screen, if it's on your phone or it's on a tablet, uh, tap the pew, warm up the fingers, get it ready for what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing a little bit of a page turning. Keep your place in Mark chapter 6. Use one of those ribbons in your Bible. If you've got one, use your bulletin. Use your prayer request slip if you didn't turn one in. Whatever you got, keep your place there. Turn with me to Matthew 14. And uh, again, I don't have this on the screen, but I also want you to be that much more engaged. So I'm grateful that I don't have this on the screen this morning. If you need to, grab one of the, the KJVs in the, in, the, in the pews. We've got two Bibles. Uh, it'll read the same as mine, a little fancier sound than what I'm reading to you, but it's, it's, just, as, it's just as good. Scoot a little closer to someone else, maybe that has one. Matthew 14. This, by the way, is the first text I ever preached in my life, 15 years ago somehow. But this was the first text that I ever preached from the, the Scriptures. Look at this, right around verse 28, Matthew 14, right around verse 28, Peter, seeing Jesus on the water... He walks out on the water to get to Jesus. That's a miracle. I've never seen anyone do that, right? He walked out on the water to get to Jesus. A few steps in. We don't know how many steps in, but we know that it at least had to be a few because it said he was walking, and so that requires at least a few steps. But a few steps in, he, he, he looks down, he starts to sink, he cries out to Jesus to save his life so that he doesn't die because he's going to drown. There's a, there's a nasty storm on the water. The waves are beating against the boat, it says. Probably very similar to that scene we saw a few weeks back in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, with the storm that the disciples went through. Verse 31. Immediately. Matthew sounds more like Mark right there. It's this Mark's favorite word. Immediately. I named our series after that. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, well, watch this. You of little faith. Why did you doubt? Notice here that doubt can't be defined biblically as the absence of faith. Because in the same breath, Jesus says Peter does have it. He's a man of little faith. He ain't a man of no faith. All right, flip a few pages forward. Same book. In my Bible, it's seven, because I, I counted. We're looking at chapter 28. Actually, just in this with the people that are getting baptized this morning, we were just in this text this morning. Matthew 28, look at verse 16. Matthew 28, 16. It says, The eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee. That's the twelve minus Judas at this point in the story. They proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to him, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're going to do that this morning, the baptizing part. But notice it says, When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. The people with some doubts are still worshipping him, because the people with those doubts aren't unbelievers. They're believers. Wrestling with not fully understanding everything, yes. Wrestling with having confidence in what they're being called to do by him, I would say almost certainly. But they're worshiping the God in front of them. The God who, who took on flesh and, and walked among them as one of them and bled for all of their tomorrows and died for all of their sins and rose to life again. They are worshiping before him. Turn to Judah. <laughs> It's only one chapter, so when you're there, you're there. Jude, it's probably only one page in your Bible, depending on the size of your print. Maybe it's one half of one page. That's how it is in mine. I'll give you a minute to get there. It's a little further than seven pages. I had a head start because I knew where we were going. So give me some amens when you get to Jude. Look how close this almost fit on one page in Jude. They almost got it, just a little shy. Look at Jude. Verse 22. It says, have mercy on some who are doubting. If you're looking at a, at a King James, it says, making a difference there. That's how it's going to read to you. And every other place where that word is translated, even in the King James, that Greek word, everywhere else, it's, it's translated Acts chapter 10, Matthew 21, Mark 11, Romans 14. It's, it's doubting. I'm not sure why the KJV translators... Had it, had it making a difference. I think that makes it a little less clear. But that's what it means, doubting. It's 
just wanted to say that in case you do have a King James or you grabbed a pew Bible or that's the one you're looking at. It means doubting. Just about every translation is going to say, have mercy on some who were doubting. I think there's one other one that says wavering in their faith. And, and again, even in that, you see that they've got faith, right? They're wavering in their faith. They've got faith. It's just they're, they're struggling. Well, Jude says, be merciful to them. Don't crush them. Don't condemn them. Come alongside them. Help them. Jesus did that. He, he did it for Thomas in the upper room. You remember, after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to some of the disciples. Thomas wasn't there. When the other disciples told Thomas, we've seen the Lord, he had a hard time believing that he doubted. What did Jesus do? He came to him, right? He said, come closer. Showed him the nail prints in his hand, said, touch him. He invited him to come closer. He did it for John the Baptist before that. And I want you to really wrap your mind around this because John the Baptist is the one who heralded the coming of Christ in the first place. He is the one who appeared in the wilderness preaching of the coming Christ. And then when he saw him, said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then his disciples began to follow Jesus' disciples. I would say he was converted pretty early. In fact, depending on how far back you want to go, the story of Jesus' conception, John the Baptist was in the womb of his mother, and we're told that he leapt in the womb at the news of Jesus. And yet, when the time came that he was locked away in Herod's prison, there was this moment. We're going to look at this in Mark's Gospel, not too long from now, Lord willing. But there's this moment when he sent a couple of his disciples to Jesus and asked are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Jesus didn't beat them up. He didn't beat him up. He said, tell them what you see. The blind receiving sight and the lame walking. Lepers being cleansed. The deaf hearing. The dead living. And the poor hearing the good news. And he said this, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. Thomas was an apostle. John the Baptist, according to Jesus, was the greatest man who ever lived until that day. And they both had doubts, according to the scriptures. Doubt is different from unbelief. Doubt can live right next to faith in our lives at times. It's not the complete absence of faith. It's a wavering. It's a questioning of faith. And, and I think that's a pretty natural thing in the age that we're living for people that are made out of dust. I think that's pretty common. It's very different from unbelief. In fact, I think it's fair to say that it's different from unbelief in the way that temptation is different from sin. Right? Because doubts, they can enter in and they can exit. Doubts, they can come and then they go. But unbelief, that's a conclusion. Unbelief is an end. It is a deliberate decision to not believe. Now that can come from doubt. Right, understand, that can come from doubt, just like sin can come from temptation. But the two are not the same thing, and we know they're not the same thing, because Jesus, we're told, was tempted in all things as we are, and yet without sin. Doubt only becomes unbelief if you let it, in the same way that temptation only becomes sin if you let it. Oswald Chambers, he wrote the, the famous devotional, my utmost for his highest. He once said this. He said, doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It might be a sign that he's thinking. There's a French proverb that says, he who knows nothing doubts nothing. Doubt is not unbelief. It can lead to unbelief. It is not unbelief. That is why it is so important to bring your doubts to God. Instead of letting your doubts drag us away from him. That's how it becomes unbelief. Where do you go when you have your doubts? You go where Thomas went. You go to the hands of Jesus. You bring it to him. He knows you have the doubts. He knows all things. 1 John 3.20. He knows all things. Let's look at uh, Mark. You can, you can turn back to Mark. Verse 5 in our text. It, it, it says he could do no miracle there except that he had laid his hands on a few sick people and he healed them. And he wondered at their unbelief. 
That there was a stubborn resistance in Nazareth when it came to Jesus. There was this refusal to believe what he was saying and to believe who he was, even though the evidence was right in front of him in his nature and in his person and in what he came to accomplish. So the, the, the question I want to put up before us this morning, and I think the Spirit of God answers it in these six short verses, the question I want to look at is, how is unbelief characterized? First, it rejects the reality of the self-evident. It rejects the reality of the self-evident. See, Jesus is returning to Nazareth, right? This is his home. He left that place as the simple son of a carpenter. He's returning as a spectacle, someone who is so surrounded with people that the text actually already has told us that he didn't have time to eat, that he had a hard time talking to people unless he actually got into a boat and put off from the shore a little ways. So he's coming back to his hometown. He's been there before once at the start of his ministry. We know that. From Luke chapter 4, if we take the whole story of Jesus, we put all of the Gospels side by side, we assemble for ourselves the fuller picture. He's already been back to Nazareth once, and last time didn't go well. And, and I'm really understating that, because what I mean is they tried to push him off a cliff. And uh, I talked, Daryl was telling me, Jed, yesterday, I talked to Daryl Shutterly, we were at a conference yesterday, and I talked to someone who's been to that cliff, and he said, it's still there. I wouldn't want to fall off that cliff, it's a long way down it's still there. They tried to push him off a cliff. He stood in their midst. Jesus actually got up in the synagogue in Nazareth, started reading from the scroll of Isaiah. This was a messianic prophecy written 700 years before he entered into this world as a man. He reads this prophecy, and he tells them, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's what he says. Well, there's a few interactions after that. There's some conversations that follow that are kind of similar to what we're reading in Mark. And, and then Luke says that the people were so filled with rage that they drove him out of the city before trying to kill him. But they didn't succeed, and he's amazingly patient. So he, he, he's coming back now to them. And, and, and while we're thinking in those terms, does anybody here today share a testimony like that? I once rejected him. I wanted nothing to do with him. I fought against his grace, and yet he came back to me in his mercy, and he met me anyway. Show of hands, is that your testimony? Did you fight against the grace of God? Were you running against him? He came back, and he met you. He's so patient, isn't he? He's so good. He's, he's full of truth, John 1, 14, but that same verse says that he's also full of grace. Same verse. And isn't it interesting that even when they did finally succeed in killing him, he came back again, and he went to the whole world. That the, the, the God who we read about in Scripture, who dwells in unapproachable light, no man can stand in his presence, no man can see him and live, that God invites us not only to approach unapproachable light, to approach his very throne, but he says in his word to do it with boldness and expectation and an outstretched hand, expecting to receive something from him. That is the gospel. That's what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. He has called us to himself. He came back to us. He's back. I want you to see there's a clear recognition in this as he's here. His words, his wisdom, even his miracles. Look at this verse. It says they were astonished by all of it. But rather than allowing for the possibility of what should have been obvious, they said, where does he, where did he get all this? Where did he get all this? If your fingers are still warmed up, you can turn to John chapter 3. You can listen if not. John chapter 3. And look right at the beginning. Look at verse 1. This is, a, this is a famous text. Look at verse 1. John chapter 3. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. It says he was a ruler of the Jews. This was a man who knew the scriptures well. And he came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God. For no one can do these signs you do unless God is with them. In other words, it's plain. Right? It's obvious. You, you, you have to go out of your way not to see it. 
Remember Mark chapter 1, people said then he spoke with authority. There was something discernibly different when Jesus got up to speak. The way that he taught, the way that he preached, the way that he ministered. In John chapter 7, they actually say, never has a man spoken like this. Never. And the people, they can't believe he knows so much because he wasn't trained like the other men were. So there was this recognition of his knowledge. It was just extensive. And by the way, they say the same thing about his disciples in Acts chapter 4. They, they, these men, they're not educated, they're not trained, but we recognize them as having been with him. And there's something different going on here. The school can only educate the mind. Theirs was a work of the heart. Theirs was a transformation of the heart. Theirs was a power. Back to Mark 2. The, the people in, in Nazareth are amazed. They, they hear it. They know it. But they don't own up to what Nicodemus owned up to. Even when some of the religious leaders were admitting this. Even if it was by the cover of night. Even if it was secretly as, as it kind of was with Nicodemus. They would not admit that his authority and his knowledge and his works. That those things were supernatural. That it was all from God. They say, where did he get all of this? They reject the reality of the self-evident. It's just like creation. You want to talk about unbelief. Romans chapter 1 says that everyone in this world, from the world around them, just from the witness of what's been made, knows there's a God. Romans chapter 1. But they suppress the truth about him in unrighteousness. That they would sooner choose to believe because they love their sin that everything came from nothing when nothing exploded one day. They would choose to believe that. They would sooner believe that everyone they've ever met is nothing more than a cosmic accident. That we're all just made out of stardust. Inadvertence, just millions and millions of years, chemical reactions and chance, they would rather grab hold of that than believe the self-evident reality that all of those thinking and feeling and relational and talented and creative individuals who can design telescopes and write symphonies and build rockets and, and do calculus and, and perform heart surgeries, than to believe that all of those people are fearfully and wonderfully made in the very image of Almighty God. Chalk it up to a lot of accidents and a lot of time. And, and yet, by the way, they will march on the streets by the thousands when one bit of purposeless stardust bumps into another their own way. When, when a white piece of highly evolved pond scum kills a black piece of highly evolved pond scum. Do you know why? Because deep down they know that there's something more. They know that we are something sacred. They know like we do that there's inherent dignity in people, that there's value in life, but they willfully reject the why. They've seen plenty. Romans chapter 1 says everyone is guilty because of what they've seen if they suppress the knowledge of the truth. They've seen plenty, they've heard plenty, but they deny the divine behind it every day of their lives until by the grace of God their eyes are opened, their hearts are transformed, and they see the reality of things. That's unbelief. That's unbelief, but the willful denial, the rejection of what's right it rejects the reality of the self-evident. Second thing that we can see about unbelief is that it, it rationalizes with the superficial. Look at how they respond to Jesus. Where did this man get these things? That's a little dismissive, I think. They know who he is. Isn't this the carpenter? It's dismissive. And we know who his mom is. We, we know who his brothers are. They named them. His sisters, they, they live right here in town. We know these people. Familiarity breeds contempt. That's how the saying goes. But I want you to notice what it is they're doing. They're, they're further fueling their decided denial of him. He can't be what he seems to be because of where he came from. Because of how normal his life was before. Because of his unremarkable upbringing. His, his ordinary occupation in this life. The, the kind of rank and file relatives that he has that we know. None of those things ought to matter, of course, especially when you take all of those things 
and, and pit them against the evidence of, you know, curing blindness and, and restoring withered limbs and cleansing leprosy with a touch and calming storms with a word and, and raising up dead daughters. But unbelief, here's what it does. It rationalizes with the superficial. It will grab hold of absolutely anything when the evidence over here is overwhelming. Well, it can't be that because of this. It's absurd sometimes what people will grab hold of to continue willfully denying the reality of God. The phrase son of Mary here, this is unique. This is just this verse in the New Testament. Only time it's ever written. We sing that one Christmas songs, I think. But this is the son of Mary. Only time it appears in the New Testament. Usually they call you, you your dad's son. So it's very possible what we see in this is actually kind of a jab. Sort of a, well, you know, from what I heard, he's not even Joseph's kid. Did you hear the story? Wonder worker, he's a woodworker. And he's not even old enough for life to have cut him down any yet. But he's got a lot of living to do before he comes here and preaches to anybody else. Whatever it takes to justify the hardness of the heart that they had, they grab hold of it. Last, last, lastly. And I want to apply a few things here. Unbelief rejects the reality of the self-evident. It, it rationalizes with the superficial. And lastly, it resents the messenger. Notice what it says. They took offense at him. They took offense at him. Remember what Jesus said to John the Baptist's disciples. Blessed is he who does not take offense. I want to say something that actually has a, has a far more universal application than just this text, but it's true here too. Being offended will often prevent you from being blessed. That's true in a general sense. It's really true here. Being offended will often prevent you from being blessed. Look at verse 5. John MacArthur, he had some great insight about this. He, he said it wasn't a power problem, this, this lack of many miracles. He said it was a purpose problem. The purpose of miracles is to attest to the truth. Well, if you've rejected the truth, there's no need for miracles. I, I thought that was good, but I actually think it's simpler than that. Few were healed because few came to him. It wasn't like that time at, at, at Peter's house where they crowded the door all night. I think whoever would have come to him would have been met by his power, but few would come. They had not because they asked not. And they asked not because they believed not. And so they didn't come. So some applications for this. Don't miss the prophetic in your life among the familiar. I think this is one of the biggest takeaways of this text. Do not miss the prophetic in your life among the familiar. Jesus said a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and in his own household. Sometimes what God wants to communicate so clearly to you is going to come from someone that's close to you. And sometimes, here's the other side of that, sometimes something that God wants to communicate so clearly to someone in, in your life, that's going to come from you because of you being close to them. And for that, I want to add these other words of Jesus. Remember what he said, a servant is not greater than his master. They might have the hardest time hearing you help you in your life. Maybe they even tried to push you off the cliff before, right? But grace goes back. He did heal a few sick there that, were it not for his grace, would have stayed sick. I'm going to point that out. He did heal some. Just the same, it says he, he wondered at their unbelief. They're, they're wondering at him. There's this astonishment. He's wondering at their unbelief that they just don't get it. It's a very graphic picture of John 1.11 where it says, He came to his own, and those who were his own rejected him. You know, there wasn't even a Christian church in Nazareth to the 4th century A.D. Hundreds of years. Last application before I head to the water this morning. I saw some people already going. Get excited. I want to I take this idea of familiarity and I, I want to contextualize it in the church. 
take this idea of the people that they, they grew up with Jesus, they were around Jesus all their lives. When he comes and they see him for who he is, they have a hard time accepting it. I want to take that and I want to contextualize it in the church. Have you become so familiar with Jesus, having been raised in the church maybe? Having spent so much of your life surrounded by the stories and, and, and singing the songs, that the words of Jesus aren't convicting you like they should. That his, his death doesn't squeeze your heart like it ought to. That his resurrection life isn't transforming your life anymore with the power that it once brought you. All those years ago, maybe, when you yourself were entering into those waters. <coughs> I, I caught something several years ago in myself. And I, I talked to other people, and um, I found out that they knew exactly what I meant, and I was relieved when that happened. I was like, hey, it's not just me. And then I was even more concerned because I said, hey, it's not just me. When I would read a book, I would, I would get a book off of my shelf, and I would be reading a book, and I would come to a place where scripture was quoted, I would find myself subconsciously skimming it. Anybody do that? Or you start to read it, you start skipping over when you read the first word or two because you go, oh, I already know what that says. I got 400 pages to read, that part I know. But the only demonstrated way that we know what it says is if our lives are conformed to what it says. And we're doing everything it says. And I don't know about you, but I wonder sometimes if Jesus isn't wondering at me a little bit like he did Nazareth. Have we, have we become so casual about him that we've begun to miss the, the controversy that he brings into our lives, that the kingdom that he brings into our lives Let's pray for a fresh view of Him, right? Eyes that see Him every day as if it was the first glorious time we saw Him. Let's pray for that. Let's come to Him. Let's draw near to Him like Thomas did. Follow His feet. Worship Him. Worship Him like they did on that mountain. Follow His feet. Worship Him. Father, may it never be that that familiarity with your son would make us slower in any way in our obedience, or that, that, that familiarity with your son, that that would make us quieter in our witness of him, or that, that our familiarity would make us far-sighted to the things of faith, or, or what it is that you're doing around us. Don't let us miss it. Uh, David wrote, as I our prayer this morning, restore to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with a willing spirit. Grant to us a deeper love. God, a truer affection. And with it, even, a fresh anointing in our lives of the Holy Spirit. That the, that the miracles that might be, that could be, that those would be done in our lives, that they would be done all around us, not just for our good, although we know God, that you seek for our good. Your word tells us, God, even in the old covenant days, looking forward to the new covenant, that I will not turn away from them from doing them good. We know that despite ourselves, you bless us because of Christ Jesus. You willingly seek our good, but we don't pray just for that. We pray for your glory. Because we love him. Because we love Jesus. We ask these things in his increasing name. Bless everyone now, God, who's, who's coming to these waters. I pray that, that we would see in it and what we're gathering for today, that we would see the message. Lord, that the preaching would continue in what we're about to see, that buried in Christ, raised to newness of life, I pray, Lord, that it would be shouted in this place. Help us to rejoice as you do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.